I remember bringing my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, by there, and I showed her, and, and she didn't even want to get out of the car. I was all excited about it, and she's like, oh my gosh, you're actually buying this? Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years with your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. Hello and welcome to episode 47. My guest today is Justin Harima, the CEO of LandContractRealty.com, which is Grand Rapids' largest land contract provider. He's also the CEO of LandContractNotes.com as well. Through his companies, Justin offers seller financing to buyers who are unable to get a loan through traditional bank lending. And he also works with experienced and beginning investors to help them in every aspect of turning and flipping properties on land contracts to buyers. And his focus is on properties that are worth between thirty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, all in. So, Justin Harma, welcome to the show today. Thank you. So, you have a very impressive uh, resume, and I know that there's a lot of things that we can talk about. But before we do, why don't you just go back to the beginning and tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and how you got into real estate investing? Sure, sure. Well, it's interesting. Uh, at some point. Uh, most people have seen some type of real estate infomercial or uh, something along those lines showing that, hey, you do a couple deals or you buy this program, you'll be sitting on a beach sipping a pina colada and never having to worry about life. Well, um, that was actually what inspired me. Back in the day, there was um, a guy out there called Carlton Sheets. And one night I was watching his infomercial, bought his program, and it didn't really teach me a whole lot, unfortunately but it did um, motivate me towards real estate. So I was 19 years old and uh, I realized pretty quickly I couldn't go to a bank. I went to from, you know, from local banks to credit unions, you name it. And they said, well, yeah, you have income and uh, uh, you know, you are low risk, but you have no credit. I was 19 years old. And I'm thinking, well, that's a good thing. I, you know, you should like the fact I have no credit. But uh, that's not how the banking world works. So I started trying to look for alternative ways to invest. And uh, I came across land contracts. So I started contacting people I knew that were in real estate, uh, finding out who, who different investors are, and uh, proposing that I buy some of their properties on land contract. Um, uh, and a couple of them were willing to do that. So. I started out buying one at a time on land contract, fixing it up, and uh, then selling it. And once I started getting um, a, a pool of those, or a, I completed a handful of those, I was then able to start going to banks, saying, "Here's what I've done," and uh, getting line of uh, line of credit, etc. So my even though I started out with land contracts, and that was the way I learned about them, and I was buying. I actually went into the rental business and started uh, renovating and renting properties out. And um, throughout uh, that stretch of uh, time between, uh, it was probably about eight years, ended up uh, developing roughly 80 rental properties. Um, and I learned pretty quickly that there's pros and cons to that. It's not all beaches and pina coladas. There's still a lot of work there. It's still business. And there was a lot of things I liked about it, but there were some things I didn't like about it. Um, but one of the big eye openers to me was when I got in a bad snowmobile accident uh, back in, uh, I believe it was right around 2009. I was, in, I was held up in, in bed for a long period of time and my wife had to step in and try to help me run my business. And uh, I just, I realized that if something worse would have happened to me, um, she wouldn't have been able to do it. And my whole goal was being able to, you know, have something set up that she would be able to take over and, and run. And uh, I realized that that just wouldn't have been the case with the rental properties I had. Now that's not everyone's situation because some people have uh, really good property management companies that they really don't have to think about a whole lot, but there's still decisions that 
come down even with that um, from, hey, this roof's leaking. Are we going to replace it? Or are you going to wait another five years? Or, you know, what's the plan on something like that? So um, I, I realized I had, uh, I, don't know, I think it was about five or six land contracts out of those 80 properties. And I realized that those were the ones I never got phone calls on. The checks just always came in. I didn't um, have you know maintenance. I didn't have repairs. So there was um, less time involved with those. And, um, and then of course you don't have your turnover rate. You don't, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's, there's some big differences there. And we can get into some of the pros and cons, of course, later in this conversation. But it occurred to me that, hey, my wife could handle that. If something was to happen to me and she had to um, still be able to provide for the kids, she could handle collecting payments on land contract. That's, that's a much easier task. And it was about then I started selling off um, all the rental properties and um, and or if a tenant moved out, converting it, um, selling it on land contract. And so um, my business model really since uh, roughly 2011 has been developing properties um, or renovating properties and selling them on contract. Um, and I, I found that there's a there's a market out there there that um, is well needed. There's a lot of people that went through a hard time. They got hit by a bank. They or they lost their home to a bank because of uh, losing their job. Or there's people that good people that have gone through a divorce or who knows what, and they're recovering through some financial issues. And so there's a lot of people that actually have, uh, you know, that are not far away from getting financing, and they don't want to rent. And I didn't realize how big that market was until I started getting into it and focusing on it. So as my inventory filled up and I was kind of getting to that capacity that we, we couldn't do a whole lot more, I realized, well, I can still keep doing them and then I'll just sell off some of these notes to hedge funds and to other investors around the United States. And, um, and so that's what we did to continue to be able to meet that need that's out there throughout West Michigan um, and to be able to help those people that are in that situation of not being able to get financing, but they're good people that, that um, really are very close to being able to get it. So, so you're able to help get them into home ownership. Mm -hmm. um, they can pay you instead of a bank, and it's a lot easier to qualify with you than it would be to get a bank loan correct correct and there has been some regulations that come out that um, there's there's still qualifying you have to do well let's, let's talk about those regulations sure. in, a, in a moment here because you, you've just you brought up a lot of things you just sure. you just loaded a lot mm -hmm. into this conversation and i want to start unpacking it here mm -hmm. um starting back at the beginning so mm -hmm. you were 19 years old yep. and you listened to carlton sheets yep. um so you were just out of high school yeah uh, pretty much yeah basically you're out of high school so uh, that brings up a, a, the first question, which is, did, did you go right into business for yourself or did you ever get a full-time job somewhere and then uh, slowly build your business over time? Yeah, that, that's, um, that, I actually went right into business. Um, I started working actually at my dad's local office supply store, and, but I realized that that was not something I wanted to do forever. So I started a lawn care company um, and I was, I was working actually a lot of hours doing um, both at first, working for receiving for him. And then when that would get out uh, early afternoon, then I would go out and with a couple other guys mow lawns and things like that. And, um, and then was doing also uh, a real estate deal one at a time, basically. Well, fast forward about a year after graduating. Where, where you, you so back to Carlton Sheets, because yeah. a lot of people have heard of Carlton Sheets, a lot of people haven't. Sure. And, and there's probably an age age difference there as to those who know Carlton Sheets and those who don't. Sure. Um, what, uh, what was Carlton Sheets' method, and were you using that in your early investing? You know, I, I, I actually learned more from connecting with some knowledgeable realtors around the area. Um, 
the the thing that Carlton would would touch on was creative financing or uh, you know doing lease options and things like that. And so I did learn about um, alternative financing basically through Carlton Sheets. Um, but those things change from state to state so much he couldn't go into a lot of depth because uh, you know for example, Florida, uh, what you would call land contract here is a contract for deed. Um, you know and the differences of how the state looks at that um, changes also. And um, so there's a lot of differences from, from state to state. so therefore I could understand why Carlton couldn't go into a lot of depth. But it opened my mind up to alternative financing, which pushed me into researching it more and more. So he did introduce the idea of land contracts. Yeah, seller financing. Selling, seller yeah. financing. Correct. Okay, and then um, yeah, let's let's talk about one of your first deals. Sure. I, you know, go go back to that deal. What what did you take bring into it, and what did you get out of it? Well. Um, I remember I was uh, dating my wife now, and um, uh, I brought her to the property. I was all excited, and this was something I think I bought for uh, thirty thousand on contract, which was a great deal back then. So you were um, able to convince the seller to carry the note, correct? So when and by the way, I mean there are some people who don't even know what a land contract is. So sure, uh, real briefly, just tell us what a land contract. Sure, is. it's basically an installment sale between a seller and and a buyer. Um, seller's going to take payments for principal and interest um, and often taxes and insurance they'll factor as well into that payment um, and but they'll the seller will hold the deed so they're in control of that deed until you're you've paid that note off um, but they you know some of them look at it as a benefit because um, they're they're shifting a little bit of that liability where it's that buyer's property, they have equitable interest, but they the seller's still holding the deed. So both parties have an you know interest in that property, but it's um, it's it's basically an installment sale. So it's different than a mortgage, where a mortgage you pay all that money at that closing and that deed is transferred. And then there's literally a loan to the bank or whoever. Yeah, a mortgage, which you would traditionally get from a bank Correct. or a, some sort of financial institution. Yep. So this is the seller providing that financing. And typically, somebody's going to be putting uh, some type of down payment down on that property. And being at the age I was, I didn't have a lot of money to put down, but I was selling other investors on you know the money I'd put into the property. So... Uh, you know, I would go into it and say, okay, I'll put $2,000 down on the property, but I'm also putting all this sweat, sweat equity into the property and renovating it. So, hey, if something goes wrong, you're getting a property back that's improved. So the seller would, would say, all right, well, this, this seems like a good deal because if they can trust you, you know, if I trust this person, if I trust Justin Harima, sure, he's going to give me 2000 to buy this property from me. I'm going to hold the note. Um, we're going to bypass the banks altogether. You'll, I'll get a monthly payment, and Justin will be improving the property at the same time. So if I ever do need to foreclose on Justin, right, uh, I'll get back a property that's in better condition than when I sold it to him. Exactly. Yup. And that's what I would go and and pitch to various investors. And not everybody was up for that, but you know, a few of them were open minded about it. Wait, when you say okay, when you say you pitched it to investors, you mm -hmm. mean investors who were selling their properties? No, these were mostly investors that were actually buying foreclosures, you know, back in um, 2002, 2003, 2004. So this was and, before the bubble you were doing. Yeah, before the bubble. And um, why, why, what was it? Why, why were you pitching to investors? It seems like you'd be pitching to sellers to carry the note. There, Where did the investors come? Yeah, in? the reason is most sellers have a mortgage on the property and they can't. Um, legally anyway, give you a land contract if they're holding um, a, some type of mortgage on that property. And the reason being is there's every type of financing has a due on sale clause. It's very, very rare to see that they don't and or it's hard to get that financial institution to um, waive that due on sale clause. So there's a it's it's risky if, if you're getting a land contract from someone holding a the note, they could have their note called on them and all of a sudden you're up a creek. 
So um, the I was going to investors because those were the people mainly paying cash for properties. And I knew that sometimes invest, there's investors out there that um, would not, they'd pick up any deal they could. And sometimes their plate was full and they couldn't get to that property. So maybe they're willing to make a quick, you know, five to 10,000 and just sell it to me on a note. And there'd still be enough spread for me to make some money. Okay. So, so you were pitching to investors because the investors were buying these properties from the seller. And or then, from from banks or from banks. Okay, so yeah. some of these were bank owned. Most properties. of them were. Okay, yes. so that okay, that's so you weren't. I guess I I assumed you were working directly with the owner and the seller of the property, but by the right. time you were actually getting into the mix, the bank owned the property. It was a bank owned property, and then um, you know an investor would buy it from a bank, and then just they wouldn't even touch it. I was trying to you know pitch them, sell it to me as is you're making some money in between just by not even touching it, just flipping it to me. So the, so these investors who had deeper pockets at the time than you Correct. did were picking up a bunch of properties. Correct. And then you would go to them and say, all right, just sell it to me on land contract. I'll fix it up. You'll, you'll make money. Right. And I'll be, I'll own it. I'll, or I'll, I'll be paying and then another, monthly for it and I'll, I'll fix it up. Yep. And another, um, you know, bonus to them was the fact that I was proposing 12 month notes. I would say, okay, well, I'm gonna have this thing done within a couple months and sell it. And so you should have all your money back, you know, within a 12 month period. I wasn't keeping these as rentals back then. Th those were properties I was renovating and just trying to make some money to get, um, you know, my feet wet in that industry. So you were flipping them at that at yes. the time then. So you would buy them uh, on land contract you know, the the, uh, the investor or seller would hold the note. Uh, what, how are you paying them each month? Just a little bit, interest only. I mean, it was usually that? principal and interest. Uh, that was uh, it was typically structured at um, a fifteen year amateuriz amateurization, mm -hmm. um, and so it was principal and interest um, on a, on like a fifteen year, and and, and I was putting uh, on average about two thousand down, and then you know, renovation costs into the property. What kind of interest were you paying? Most of them um, were between nine to 11%, which okay. is, you know, a little higher, but back then actually a fairly average rate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> interest rates were a lot higher back then. Yeah, I mean, you're talking 2001, 2002, that, that seems pretty good on a, on a land contract. Yeah. What, uh, and then you had a 12 month balloon, meaning right. that after 12 months, the note came due, you had to pay it in full. Correct. So. What did you do at that? How would you pay that note in full at that point? You would flip it to another buyer on land contract I never, or you just sell it outright? Sure. I never ended up running into that problem because I had those properties sold before then um, because we, I'd get on them right away, renovate them, and then just sell them on the open market, um, listing them. So I never ran into that issue where a balloon came due. Um, I think I was, you know, so young back then, I never really thought through, okay, how is this all going to work out if that comes up? Um, I was just excited to get into the business. Yeah, had you been wet. four or five years <laughs> later, you would have run into the, the recession, which I'm sure will, yeah. you, you have some experience there as well, I'm sure. But sure. Yeah. So you were, you were just outright selling them. At that point, Correct. you weren't selling them on land contract. You were just selling them on the open market. Correct. Okay. Yep. Getting my feet wet in, in, in the business and then just trying to get a um, um, you know, handful of deals done that were profitable. So then the goal was just so I could be able to bring that to a bank and show them that I know what I'm doing. And if you give me a line of credit, I can make more money because I can now buy them directly from banks. And um, there's no one in the middle making money off me. Um, of course, banks would be, you know, they're making a little bit, but um, there's no markup in between. So that was my goal and and that's what i did but you, you had asked me about my first first deal that i did and um it was it was over by uh i think it was um hall and uh division area here in grand rapids yeah. michigan yeah mm -hmm. exactly in grand rapids and um i remember bringing my girlfriend at the time my wife now by there and i, I showed her and and she didn't even want to get out of the car She's like, oh my gosh, this this thing you're actually buying this and um, and anyway, 
I said, I was all excited about it, and I could see the end. How result. much were you picking this up for? I, I believe it was right around twenty eight thousand or somewhere in there. 000. Yeah, which mm -hmm. back then was a was a great price. Uh, you couldn't find anything around Grand Rapids in that kind of price range, you know, prior to the um, uh, recession hitting. So, um, single family. It was a single family home. Yep. Um, it had, you know, unlevel floors and all kinds of stuff. The structure was good, but you know how you get some of that settling and oh, yeah. stuff like that in the old, real old houses. So I, I, um, you know, did a whole bunch of cosmetic repairs and, um, ended up selling it. Didn't make a lot, but I think it maybe made $4,000, which wasn't a lot, but on, on contract and just getting my feet wet on my first deal, I was really excited about that. Mm -hmm. So, um, how, just, how much work and time did you put into it? Um, you know, a few things I subbed out. Um, I I basically just did uh, some of the drywall repair and um, priming and painting, and then other items I subbed out. Um, so, um, I mean, it, it was probably done in 30 days, but I, I personally probably had about um, a week and a half of work into it. So that was the other thing. At that age, I'm thinking, okay, I worked out a week and a half on this and, you know, made $4,000. So to me, that was, you know, really good money. Yeah, and that's 4000 after expenses. So after right. you paid your subcontractors, yeah, nah, materials, yep. everything. Right. And, and most, most people that are doing the business full-time, if they flipped a house and made $4,000, they'd, they'd be kicking themselves like, man, I wasted all this time, you know? Uh, yeah. But at 19 years old, that was, that was motivating to me. So... Yeah. Um, and I knew that if I got it down and and got the system better and was able to get, you know, financing at some point, then I could um, uh, uh, make it uh, even more profitable. So, yeah. So, so, how did you then grow that business? What what it seems like you did more of those. Mm -hmm. um, did you have similar types of success? Yeah, on land contract, I never cleared. You know. Um, a lot of money. They they were mostly you know four to eight thousand dollar profit ranges, and um, um, I that really was just a short term period that I was doing those one at a time. Um, so it was really hard to make a lot of money in those because of the fact they're already being marked up, and um, um, so there's obviously a good amount of profit being. Eat, eaten up from the guys I was buying them from on contract. So yeah, you. So the the sellers who were or the investors who were selling them to you on land contract, they were making more money than you were at that point. Huh? Yes. Okay. Yep. So how'd you turn that around? What, what realization did you come to, and and what you do? Well, my goal was always to get out of that situation anyway, and, and just do that as experience. So then when um, after it was f five or six of those. I had put together a spreadsheet, all my costs, and I started going to some local banks, and um, and I was able to get a line of credit, and um, from there, I was able to buy, um, you know, foreclosures directly and offer cash, etc. And um, so I continued to flip, but my goal then, once I was able to get a line of credit, was to was to was to flip and keep, you know. Um, keep a rental property so do a rental but also do some flips and um i continued to do that um basically all up until i believe it was 2010 and um uh, right around when i started switching to my land contract model but as time progressed um, i went mostly to hanging on to properties and doing rental properties so, so your goal at that at that point was to use the flips to finance your buy correct. and hold strategy. Correct. Um, so I did that basically all up until the recession, and then once that hit, you know, it, it's you're looking at it and saying, well, how can you go wrong at these prices out there? So then I went to you know pretty much just doing rental properties and not flipping. So you were on a buying spree. Buying Went on a buying right? spree. So did you get hurt at all in the recession? Because it seems like you would have been positioned to, to possibly have lost some money or uh, or maybe not, not. Because if you didn't have traditional yeah. bank loans that were being called, right? Uh, maybe maybe that insulated you a bit. 
Um, so yes and no. I don't think anybody, no matter what their position w was, went through any great experience through that time period. Um, but the uh, most of the properties that I was holding at that time, I was able to start selling because as I was buying properties cheaper and cheaper every day, um, I'm saying, okay, something. Um, there's something I don't know happening. There can't be the, the next best deal of the year every every other day that I'm seeing. And the general, the the retail market wasn't recognizing that, but as I'm seeing all these foreclosures So this is before the, the news yeah. media recognized yep. that the bubble had burst. This you were like, seeing the prices coming down. Yep. Late, uh, early 2007, you know, right in there, um, I'm seeing all these foreclosures starting to come out and so, um, so yeah, started selling off as many rentals as possible at that point, and then kind of loading back up. But yeah, there were certainly a handful that you know I had to hold because they didn't sell, and then the prices on on them went down dramatically. But they still made sense, and they still were cash flowing because rents really didn't get hit as hard as the actual values. So maybe your rents went down a little bit, but they, it wasn't nearly as drastic as the actual values on the properties. So it was easy enough to maintain the the few that I was still holding at that time frame. Well, what about your, your line of credit? Because if you had a line of credit from a bank mm -hmm. and that was allowing you to purchase these properties, did they ever pull that line of credit and, and maybe call it in? No, um, it's it's actually... You know, it was kind of interesting because of the volume that I, I did and the, the volume of flips. Um, I was actually able to go get more lines of credit uh, during that period. Yeah, during that period. But um, that was really before the boards recognized how bad this recession was hitting them. And um, so when the FDIC, who regulates the banks, recognized how over leveraged some of these banks were, it wasn't until about 2010 that they really started, 2009, 2010, that they really started putting heat on their clients to pay down lines of credit. So, um, yeah, and, and I know a lot of people in the business that got really hurt during that time frame, but uh, they, they did. They put pressure on anybody they could, and uh, it was right around 2010 that they said, okay, we're not extending any more lines of credit, and the FDIC was trying to get these banks in their opinion, back in balance where they felt they were over leveraged and they felt really every bank was over leveraged in real estate. So that was the big area they were hitting on was was real estate and trying to get um, their exposure in real estate down. Right. So how did that affect you? I mean, because if in 2010, the banks were being pressured by the government to, sure. to rein in their line of credit uh, lending. Sure. What happened to you? Well, there? what I found was um, not every bank was in that situation. So you'd have some banks over leveraged and some were not. And so where you'd have one bank that's getting hammered by the FDIC, you got another bank that's doing very well and um, in a great position. So um, there was actually three local banks I was working with. So if you had one that was tightening up, you could go to the other and say, look at so-and-so over here, they're, want, they're wanting this and this you know, paid down, what kind of rates can you give me? And kind of shop it around. If you worked hard enough at it, there was always a bank that was willing to deal with people if they were in a good position on properties. Really, so but, who'd you have good luck with? Uh, well, now it's Chemical Bank, Byron, Byron Bank, uh, they, they were good. So it was um, Byron Bank who got absorbed by chemical? They got absorbed by chemical, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were never really in any kind of bad um, position from what I saw. And um, they they seemed like they um, really never messed with anyone's lines of credit or anything like that. So I at least I never had any kind of bad experience with them. Well, I, good for you. You, you, yeah. you picked the right banks in the beginning and uh, ended up relatively unscathed through that, that period. You know, um, a anybody that was holding property during that period obviously lost um, a lot of equity and, and went, went through, um, you know, having to deal and work through that, that era. Um, but if, if they worked through it and continued on with business, they could more than make up for it with being able to buy all the cheap inventory that was coming out. 
And so that's what that's what I was trying to do. Um, back then was just load up on all this cheap inventory. Yeah, talk, talk about the cheap it. inventory. What what were you buying? How much were you buying? And, and what were you buying it for? Sure. Most of the properties were anywhere from fifteen to thirty thousand dollars back then. And, and are you, were you focusing on single families only? Single family homes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 50, there's what, a you few. said fifteen to thirty thousand, huh? Yeah. Wow. That, well, that's what a lot of them were going for back then. I mean, you can't find anything in that price range now. But um, yeah, there's properties left and right for fifteen to thirty grand. I remember one that I bought for seventy five hundred, and I could not believe it because it was actually in pretty good condition and good looking home. And um, what, what kind of neighborhoods were these in? Um, they really they they varied quite a bit. The, I really I focused a lot around like the Garfield Park area. Um, if you're familiar with that, it's close to Elger Heights. Um, so I did quite a bit there on the northeast side of town, um, you know, like College and, um, and Leonard area, those okay. neighborhoods um, on the northwest side of town, uh, you know, between Alpine and Valley. Um, there's, uh, yeah, uh, the whole northwest, really, but uh, basically all over. Mm -hmm. um, the seventy-five hundred dollar house. That was actually a house on Watkins, um, and um, yeah. So it was it was a wide variety. I, I did dabble in some higher end flips as well. Um, I back then um, there was some really um, there was a, there was one property in Ada, for example, that uh, the people owed seven hundred seven hundred sixty thousand, I believe. And um, I picked it up for two twenty. Wow! And um, then, Ada. Yep, yep. And it was a, a beautiful house. Um, had an outdoor sauna house, outdoor fire pits all over. Um, I ended up putting about eighty thousand into it, just putting all new cabinets, granite, doing some high end finishes in the home, and um, and then flipping it. Um, you know, and made some money, but. I found that the high-end flips back then were hard to get your what should be retail value because every agent's looking at what you paid for it and there's so many foreclosures out there you're competing with that it was really hard to make what you should be able to make on them. So even though I bought it right and had a lot of equity in it, you know, I I didn't actually walk away with like this massive amount of money. I think I ended up making like $40,000 on it, which for that risk in with, with that amount of capital it was kind of like uh you know not bad but yeah you're looking at around a 20 percent return right but the risk uh that's associated with that was was probably not worth it exactly and then um you know i i bought uh, a, a big house in east grand rapids that was actually part of the old Bissell estate and um and i learned pretty quickly on that that was the first one i realized that you can sell a property for more than what you paid and quickly lose money <laughs> and uh so i sold that for you know um a decent amount more than what i paid for it but um the east grand rapids summer tax bill non-homestead coming out on that thing was like forty eight thousand dollars oh my gosh and you add that with you know um the overhead of just an insurance on a place like that when it's vacant and um your utilities and and then when you're selling it, your realtor fees and transfer co transfer tax and uh, title insurance, and you just start adding everything up. And the more expensive the home you go, the the higher those costs are, costs are. So, um, the, you know, I I did a handful of I, I would say higher end flips, and uh, and and have stayed clear of that now because. Um, because of the risk associated with that so on that on that property like that's a that was a bad experience i think i lost like sixty thousand um, dollars wow so you, you a, made a profit on the sale but the holding costs are what crushed you right exactly mm -hmm. yep so um and basically through this whole period and um through buying you know after the recession buying properties cheap doing them as rental properties and um you know the that whole nine yards that's where i found um to me the land contract model just fitting better for what i for what i do all right so you tried some of the high-end flips yeah. and uh, really found that the the 
any profit you were making was not worth the risk. So it seems like you've concentrated then more on the, the, the less expensive properties. Right. Um, wait, tell me, uh, at, at this point, were you still buying and holding or were you um, flipping and, and selling on land contract? Um, at that point, I was I was buying and um, uh, renovating and then renting, renting properties out. So I was mainly holding. Were you um, managing yourself? After the re recession. Um, I tried both. I tried some property management companies. Um, and then I also had uh, a guy brought on full time that was managing in-house. So I, I, I went both directions on it. And um, there's some great property management companies I've met, you know, after the fact, uh, some of them were not really doing business back then. But um, I realized pretty quickly that you, you definitely need to screen um, the property management companies you use. <laughs> Talk about that. What, what were some of the problems you encountered? Sure. Um, well, there was, uh, there was one particular company that um, our contract stated that any repairs over a hundred dollars would be authorized by me. So they would send an email or something to that effect. And consistently um, there was uh, various charges from 800 to even up to $2,000 that were never authorized and were um, items that I, I realized later were, they were not needed and they had a relative doing these things um and so, so was, they were just was, trying to generate some cash for uh, uh, uncle bobby huh exactly <laughs> and and i caught on to it because a couple of the times i don't think they realized that you know there there was um you know two newly rehabbed properties and it was like you know the next month after getting them to the property management company there was a fee of repainting and I said, oh, you know, and wow. I had pictures that this was renovated and new tenant placed in. So, um, so I ended up finding um, other investors with the same type of complaints that, um, uh, yeah, had realized that it, this company was a big mess. And uh, and so then, even after switching to another property management company, there was a lot of Section Eight rents that were coming in and they never released those and um so you mean the pre so you fired the the first management mm -hmm. company switched to a new one but the first management company never released uh, the yeah. section eight rents so they so were keeping your rent there's always a lag there's always a lag with section eight um um rents or i shouldn't say a lag but they have to sign off that they're releasing that over to the new party so even after i switched all the other rentals the rents still were going to this other company because they didn't sign these forms to release the rents. Wow. So were they cashing the checks and keeping the money? Yeah. Or did they, so that's they, what happened. Really? Oh, you know, like, that's criminal. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So um, they ended up settling um, after, you know, pursuing the situation. But um, I and I don't even think this this company's around anymore. But uh, I realize you definitely need to uh, screen your property management uh, management companies before you go use them, and and maybe even call several of their clients, you know, to get a feel for what their experiences are. Um, yeah, you have to do your due diligence mm -hmm. on the the management team, just like you would do your due diligence on the property. Exactly, exactly. So um, uh, I had I had never used a property management company up to that point, so that was the first one I ever went to they had a you know great sales pitch but there was no real real backbone or structure behind it um so there like i said i'm not trying to freak anybody out about property management companies there's some great ones out there but uh you definitely need to be aware that um, um you have to screen these people because you're giving them a lot of power um when they're managing your properties and they're mm -hmm. collecting they're collecting the rents and deducting out expenses, et cetera, and then releasing it to you. So they have a lot of power um, when um, they're in that position. And if you get somebody that's unethical, then it's it's going to uh, it's going to hurt you. So yeah, absolutely. So you, it sounds like you you switch to another third party management company. 
Um, and then you brought someone uh, uh, under your employment to, to kind of handle your properties. What, what was that transition for? Yeah. Um, the, the other property management company, I wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't any experience like that, um, by any means, but, um, uh, I had an opportunity where there was, um, an old, you know, friend that I knew for a long time that was, that had managed for years, um, apartment complexes. And, um, he was very detailed, very, you know, energetic and, um, and I thought it'd be a good fit. So how many properties did you have at that time? Um, you know, I don't recall exactly offhand, um, enough to make it your, worth it. Yeah, it was enough to make time. it worth mm -hmm. it. Right. Exactly. So, um, and then, and then basically did that up until the point that I started going, um, strictly to land contracts. Yeah. So, yeah. So it was around this time you had these rental properties, you had your accident, you were in the hospital yeah. and your thought was, well, you know, how's my, if, if something worse had happened to me, what would my wife do right. with these properties? And that's what got you thinking, well, I need to reduce the, the risk for her. Right. Uh, and, and th did you just like slowly over a period of time start selling off the rentals or did you uh do it all at once it was a little bit of both um because there were you know tenants that would move out and then i would just replace them with uh, or i would sell the house and land contract then um but then i also was just selling off rental properties as well because i was trying to transition as quickly as possible and um so it was a little bit of both because there was investors that would come in and say, well, I would like five properties, five rentals, you know, that sort of thing. Um, is, is this around the time you started land contract realty? Yeah. Um, there was a little bit of a time period actually prior to that, um, that, uh, that we would just advertise on Craigslist and stuff like that. But as it progressed, then I realized, Hey, we have to have, uh, you know, a brokerage, we have to have a real estate broker and um, um, run it through that. And that's when Land Contract Realty was created. Okay, so you turned it into a real business. Correct. And, and yeah. the reason you needed to have a, a real broker was what reason? I felt like for selling our own properties, yeah, I could have, you know, just use different agents um, and have an agreement with whatever agents and pay them some negotiated fee. But I felt like that wasn't really giving, gaining or giving control. So if I'm giving them leads that we're generating online, how do I know they're actually going to sell our properties, you know, or my properties, et cetera? Um, where if it's because they could take your leads and sell them some another property exactly, that listed. exactly. Right. So cause that, that, that's what I did for a while was just used various agents, and we just have a contract with them that hey, you're going to get paid this, but so here's the lead and um we would generate a lot of leads online and then they were supposed to sell our properties but there there was a lack of control there and then multiple times finding out that these people bought other properties that they pushed them into and so, you didn't get any sort of no uh, money no. from from giving those leads in the first place huh right exactly so we were generating enough interest, you know, online, you know, getting, um, you know, a couple hundred hits a day, et cetera, on some various websites. So were you just yeah. advertising on, on websites like Craigslist no. or did you set something up that was more formal? No, I had um, actually a lot of like landing pages and stuff like that where um, these leads were created. Uh, Craigslist was another one, but, you know, there's a lot of other landing pages that um, I had out there. And they basically were all directed then to a you know a phone number and or email, where then these leads would be turned over to other agents. So we we changed that to where land contract realty is the focal point of generating leads. And there's still some other landing pages, but they go back to there, and then it and then it's being handled um, through agents under land contract realty. Okay. So they're the ones that are selling these properties on land contract then um, once they're ready to be sold. And, um, and, then, and then from there, um, most of these notes are then sold off at a discounted rate to hedge funds and other investors around the, the U.S. 
Wow. So you must have had quite a volume going then if you're dealing with hedge funds and you've got multiple brokers working for you. Yeah. Um, you know, we it, on a busy month, we've we've um, done up to 10 and um, I would say an average month, uh, three to four. So um, we've had a decent amount of volume. And as that as the market has increased and prices have gone up, um, we've had to go into other areas. So now we cover, um, you know, like Kalamazoo, we cover um, Allegan, um, go up to like, uh, even up to like Whitehall, Montague area, um, you know, Big Rapids, basically all over because the properties that we're looking for are very specific. We have to buy them at a, um, you know, big enough discount that then the property can be sold at a retail price once it's fixed up that offers still an affordable rate to that land contract buyer. But then that in return, we can sell at a discount to an investor looking for a good return. So, um, you know, yeah. you mean sell the note to an investor or correct. sell the because you sell it to someone on a land contract, right? Then the investor would be buying that, that land contract, basically. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep, hedge fund investor, etc. Then buying that note. So, and if funds were unlimited, we'd we'd keep every single one. But uh, it, it becomes very costly trying to hang on to three to four a month. You know that starts adding up in a hurry. So, um, and you, it's really hard to get financing for land contracts. Like I said, so if you're trying to use lines of credit or banks, uh, there's due on sale clauses. And so it's not like you can go get uh, millions of dollars of lines of credit. So, um, you know, because there, there's these due on sale clauses. So there's a limited amount uh, that you can really grow your own portfolio, so to speak. Um, and so that was one way around it for me was uh, developing a system that is offering still a good return for someone that let's say is using a self-directed IRA and they want something in their self-directed IRA that's just gonna uh, give back a nice steady return. So um, they, they might buy the note, correct. the land contract, and put it in their self-directed IRA. Correct. And that would give them a nice steady return. And that's what most of um, the, the people I deal with do because, um, you know, what, what, are the, what are the big perks of a rental property? It's, you know, depreciation and some of those write-offs. Well, on a land contract, you don't have that. But they look at it, well, if it's in my self-directed IRA, I don't really need that. They don't need much. the tax benefits right. because they're already getting the, exactly. the IRA benefits. Exactly. Wow. Okay, so no. let, let me let me let me make sure I understand your, your business now because it's it's sort of transformed to what it was in the beginning. Now <laughs> right. now you're you're running this like land contract empire. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it's it sounds like your your business now is focused entirely of working with banks. Who who feed you this pipeline of like properties that you can pick up at a, at a good price? You pick them up, mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk about where you get the money to pick them up in a moment. But you pick them up, and then you either um, fix them up and sell them on land contract, or just maybe flip the notes directly to to a hedge fund or, or a buyer. So you're dealing. So you're you're the two paths are either create your own land contract mm -hmm. and sell it to, to a, a homeowner mm -hmm. who's going to pay you. Mm -hmm. And then the other path is take those notes and s sell those to investor or hedge fund. Yep, exactly. Yep. It's basically, you know, building a portfolio and or taking some of those notes that have been sold on contract and then selling them off to an investor or hedge fund to turn that money and be able to keep doing it. Wow. So, yeah, so, th so there's so that. much to that there. I mean, f first of all, are you still working with lines of credits from banks so that you can pick these up? Or do you have uh, now private investors who are who are investing with yeah, you? Yeah, not, not as much anymore because it's it's really difficult. Um, and uh, there's there's really I have I haven't found any good sources for that. Which part is difficult getting the lines of credit? Lines of credit, yeah, mm -hmm. for that that don't have a due on sale clause. So if you have a line of credit that's unattached to any kind of real estate, you'd be fine. But that's very very difficult to do. 
Um, the oh, so, so the lines of, okay, so maybe I, I got to understand lines of credit because I thought lines of credit are, okay, this bank is saying, all right, Justin, you, we'll give you a hundred thousand dollars. You can go play with it, do whatever you want. But you're saying if you go buy a, a property with it and then you sell that mm -hmm. property, that line of credit is due. It's a, it's attached. Yeah. Um, pretty much every line of credit that commercial lending gives you is going to be attached to the real estate. So what happens is they'll say, okay, we'll give you a million dollar line of credit, but we're, we're going to fund all your purchases up to 80%. Let's say, so you have a hundred thousand dollar house you want to buy. They're going to fund $80,000 okay, of it. So they're being very specific about how you can use that line of yes. credit. So it's not the, it's not the type of line of credit you were getting in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, well, both, um, you know, they're most of the lines of credit that I used in, in the beginning of, uh, of real estate were, the same way um mm -hmm. they and that's why i had to flip as well to be able to have money for the down payment and renovations etc because they they wanted you know some skin in the game still so there was one bank that had a line of credit that was unsecured it was you know mm -hmm. what they call it, an unsecured line of credit they're very difficult to get um but one bank that what that did it but it was not you know some real large number but there's a lot of banks out there that would give you commercial lines of credit for 500 grand or a million, et cetera. But it's very specific. It's going to be attached to that real estate and they're going to only fund a certain amount of the purchase agreement. Um, and, um, uh, and again, it's all got the verbiage about due on sale clauses and stuff like that. So, all right, I'm thinking of another mm -hmm. investor I was talking to, and he got a line of credit for over a half million dollars, mm -hmm. but he also owns a lot of properties free and clear. Mm -hmm. So it was secured against those properties, and now he's able to go take that and do whatever he wants with it. Does that make sense? Yeah. But, so it sounds like you're, you're securing... Similar. You're securing your your uh, line of credit against the properties you're going to buy, right? Okay, it, but it's a sim it's very similar. So, mm -hmm. and the tough thing about that is if you're securing getting a line of credit against some paid off properties, you want to be very specific about what they'll release and and how much for. Because what I ran into different times is I wanted to sell, uh, you know, one two three James Street. Um, and I have, let's say, forty thousand dollars into it, and I want to sell this thing for seventy-five thousand um, dollars. Where's your agreement that they're going to release it for forty thousand, even though that's what they collateralized it as? They might say, no, we're, we're going to take seventy-five thousand and pay your note off faster. Right. So they you banks wanna, love using their discretion to. Uh, kind of it, gum up the works okay. exactly yeah. exactly so and that was the tough stuff that i had to deal with during that recession because that's uh you know in the 2010 era etc for you were selling properties attached to a line of credit they were definitely taking they were, more they than were gonna they were going to force actually, you to pay down that note yeah, a lot quicker exactly that line of credit a lot quicker so that would be my recommendation if someone is going to look at a commercial line of credit is verifying what they're going to release as well with what you're attaching right so so okay then getting back to funding what you're mm -hmm. doing now mm -hmm. wh where are you coming up with the funds to, to buy these properties or buy these notes uh most of them are through various partnerships or private money and, okay so um, you're working with private money now mm -hmm. now is that yeah. a uh, looking at your website and everything it seems like that's a particular part of your business working with private investors who want to loan you money uh, to, to go out and do what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, yeah, that, that hasn't been like a, you know, a focal point of mine trying to develop those types of relationships, but it's just happened. Um, you know, running into people that have IRAs and they might just want to do loans from their IRAs and make a return versus getting into actually holding real estate. So I ended up meeting over the years people that just want to do, um, you know, do notes, for example, or loans from their self-directed IRAs, you know, make a little bit of a fee and some interest. And, um, and that's really all they cared about. Hey, it's going to perform better than the stock market. And it's pretty safe if it's somebody that, you know, um, I've dealt with for a while, mm -hmm. you know, or, someone or who has a track, track record exactly. of success. 
So right. th basically, then you're getting your lines of credit at, in the form of loans from private investors. Right. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, so that helps. So now, so then you're taking that and you're going out and are you working directly with banks then to pick up foreclosures or do you have another uh, pipeline to get these types of properties? Um, not necessarily directly with banks. Um, there's a lot of different ways we're, you know, um, doing, um, we're buying foreclosures, but often they're ones that are hitting the market because there's no real solid way to buy them before they hit the market. You know, Fannie and Freddie really control the market on that. And um, they require a property to be listed for at least 14 days before they'll accept um, a bid. So foreclosures have become harder to buy without competition. Um, back in the day, it was easy. I, you just, if you knew the agent, hey, don't list this. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll let you have both sides of the commission and you know, uh, they could get it pending. That, that, that's not the case at all anymore. Um, same with HUD deals. HUD, HUD, you have to have it listed for 30 days before an investor can buy. So I actually, um, I deal quite a bit with um, uh, just sellers that are motivated. Um, that's become a bigger part of my, um, um, my target. And, um, uh, you know, we're still doing for, you know, buying foreclosures we're we're getting uh we're doing the um bidding for you know sheriff's deeds um you know there's still a variety of ways we're picking up properties and the way that i look at it is i don't really care how, who i'm buying it from all i care about is the numbers and that it works for what we do so um there's and, and I could probably go on for an hour on all these different strategies of just how to buy and uh, you know but there's there's no really right or wrong way it's really as long as the numbers make sense yeah, name one be, of your strategy what's what's one of your favorite strategies well auctions have become a bigger one lately because that's been a push by the banks that's the one way that they'll take something without it being listed on the market finding motivated sellers is one you know i work with several wholesalers that get properties at a, a negotiated with at a pretty good rate with a with a seller they're making a little bit of money but they're giving those properties over to me before they're never listed. There's no, no real history on that property where it was sitting on GRAR for you know 90 days or whatever. So you've had some good um, luck working with wholesalers who are out there finding these deals and then a few. open them to you. Yeah, yeah, a few. And then there's the wholesalers out there too that send me stuff all the time and it's priced way too high. There's a few good ones out there. We're still doing a lot of foreclosures, auctions, um, uh, sheriff's deeds, you know, all, all those types of things. So it's a, it's a big variety. What have you noticed about the market lately? I mean, we're, we're talking in November of 2016, you know, definitely there's been a run up in values, uh, home values. Mm -hmm. uh, how has that changed your business? Are, are you, what, and what do you see on the horizon? It has been going up and quite dramatically in Grand Rapids. Um, it's, uh, um, it's been harder for us to make our model work because of the price points we have to be able to buy at and the value we have to be able to su supply. And um, so Grand Rapids has got, you know, become harder for us to um, have our focus here. So we're having to go other areas, like I mentioned earlier, Kalamazoo, Allegan, um, um, basically all over the place. I look at anything within an hour of Grand Rapids and um, uh, so we've had we've we never did that before, and so it used to be just Grand Rapids, and uh, so that's what's really changed in our business. So we've still been able to maintain volume levels and and still the you know similar types of price points, but now our our markets have changed a little bit, and we still do deal in Grand Rapids. It's just um, not as much volume because the prices have continued to rise, and there's been more competition. So. You know, there's more investors bidding on properties that you're competing against. And um, so we're, we really focus on properties where there's not property management companies. We don't need property management companies. We use what's called note servicers. So there's note servicers that actually manage and handle the note, service the paper. Um, 
I mean, a no, so a note servicer, when you say they handle the note, they make sure that the, the person who's supposed to pay every month is paying. They're paying, they're tracking the taxes and insurance, they're, and then they're dispersing funds to that the, the actual owner. So if a note is sold, that, that buyer's not having to deal with updates and where, hey, you have to now send your payments over here, et cetera. It still is being maintained by the same company, even though on the back end it might change. So, um, but a note servicer isn't going to do plumbing repairs or handle any of that stuff because it's not needed. Um, so we can, we can deal in areas where there's not property management companies, which makes it l less competition for us because the, 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 the markets that become harder to, for us to deal in, it, it's where the property management companies are and it's because they have so many investors wanting to buy more rental properties and obviously they're there to manage them but if you look at like allegan for example uh you're not going to find a property management company that deals in allegan um so and maybe at some point that changes so we, we actually deal a lot in suburbs um we'll deal in you know howard city newago stuff that's still close to grand rapids close enough to drive to it might be um you know a single family house set up on uh three or four acres you know type of thing there's a lot of homeowners wanting that um but i don't have the same type of competition that i deal with in grand rapids right because if you're buying or you know purchasing or selling on a land contract or buying the note you don't have to worry about it being a rental and you having to manage the property Right. And the tenant, you're just managing the, the, the mortgage, right. basically. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And that's the other business that, that you kind of advertise, which is... Um, yeah, landcontractnotes.com. And if you go to that site, you'll it'll force you to um, create a login um, and register. But uh, once, once you register, you can view the available notes that are out there. And um, the inventory changes all the time, but they're always sold at a discounted rate. And, um, you know, every couple of weeks or so, you'll see that inventory change around. So, um, uh, yeah, that, that's basically the website for investors. Okay. So, so, that's so if there's an investors. investor listening out there who, who's like, I really like what Justin's talking about. I'd love to, to purchase some of these notes, uh, whether through my self-directed IRA or, or however, yep. they can go to landcontractnotes.com yep. and, uh, and see what you have to offer. Correct. Yep. It's kind of like Amazon where you just put it in right. you know, <laughs> yeah. your, put note, it in your put shopping it in cart and, and everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't have the shopping cart and uh, set up for running it on your credit card or anything like that. But um, yeah, it's pretty simple. They can view then what the, the principal and interest is, what the down payment is, you know, was the sale date on that um, transaction, all those things. What kind of returns uh, would they typically be able to expect? You know, most of our notes are, are, going to be about a 12 to 13 percent um return on average but that that goes up a little bit if that buyer refinances within um you know let's say a five-year period because they're buying the note at a discount um typically it's right around a 15 percent discount off the balance well that's captured if that buyer refinances you know in a short period of time so let's say they're getting $6,000 off or $8,000 off that note balance. Um, so if that buyer refinances in two years, they're capturing that extra spread. So the monthly ROI is, is typically between, um, like I said, you know, 12, 13%, but it, that the, the overall ROI jumps up upon that buyer refinancing. Okay. So you get, get a little bit more more mm -hmm. money in the back end there what uh, right. so let me just get this straight the notes that they would be buying on the site are from properties that you would have purchased out of foreclosure right. sold on land contract and then you're turning around and selling that land contract note to these investors right right gotcha yeah I and mean, we have detailed files as far as pictures and everything goes so when someone's interested in one of those notes it's hard to go in there and see it because of course there's someone living in the property so we have detailed pictures, video, et cetera, um, of that property, 
before someone moved in after the work was done. Because right. it seems like a note buyer is probably not going to be able to inspect the property. It's it's harder to. We have to make calls and arrange those things mm -hmm. um, in order to do it. So sometimes it's a request, but I can't always guarantee that. It's a little bit more difficult to do. Gotcha. So. I mean, wouldn't you be more con concerned with the ability of the, the person who who's bought the, the property to be able to pay? Yeah, exactly. And that's where, you know, good screening comes into play. So, you know, we look at all the credit files to, to, you know, say, okay, do these people have a realistic shot of refinancing within, you know, three, four years, you know, three to four years, somewhere in there. And um, if they have a few dings on their credit, uh, but they have steady income, um, we, we have a very specific debt to income ratio we're looking for. We have a very specific down payment amount we wanna see um, and if they meet all the, that criteria, then we approve them. But we certainly don't approve just anybody that comes through the door with five, six grand down. We've had people that come in, say, we got 10,000 to put down on your $70,000 house and we have to turn them down. So, um, uh, debt to income ratio and proof of income is very specific. And then also their credit history, making sure they haven't had evictions or you know they don't have judgments, things of that nature. So we expect you know some some type of damage on their credit, but we want to make sure it's not to the point that it can't be fixed in a fairly short period of time. And what kind of team do you have working with you or for you that allows you to do all these different things? Um, we have, we have, in my opinion, the best team. <laughs> uh, we have three agents, um, and then, um, and then we three have, agents who are out there selling these properties on, on land contract. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one one uh, one of the agents is mainly focused on um, the purchase side, helping me find the best deals out there, and um, two of them are focused on selling the properties. Um, and then, um, you know, of course there's, you know, we, we have a transaction coordinator that helps with, um, the transactions on both ends of it, whether it's the land contract buyer, um, working on the closing and getting numbers for closing and, um, putting the, their, you know, insurance stuff together or whether it's selling the note and coordinating with the title company on that end of things. So, um, the, so uh, our, our transaction coordinator helps out a lot with that stuff, but that that's basically it. And then, uh, of course, a couple construction crews out there to rehab the properties. Okay, so you have your own guys who who you send out to do this kind of work. I wouldn't say my own because it's not like you know it's not like uh you know I have any kind of construction company or anything like that. It's all subbed out, but I have some r reliable teams to go to for sure. What advice do you have out there for our listeners? who are looking to get into real estate investing and um, you know, wondering if, if the way that you've done it is the way to go. Well, what I've found out is uh, real, you, can do, you can do real estate um, uh, a lot of different ways. And I have some good friends in real estate that, that have some uh, different, different models out there, completely different than mine, but they make a good living. And um, <clears throat> so I can't say one way is right or wrong, but if you're looking to do uh, land contracts, I strongly suggest using an attorney. Um, the horror stories I've heard from people on land contracts, it's where they didn't screen someone properly. They, they let them in with $2,000 down um, or they didn't ever pull their credit and they find out later that they have all kinds of issues. Um, so good screening is definitely a must and I would, I would recommend going to an attorney um, to, to, uh, help you with that transaction. Um, but that really that's, that's my advice on, um, um, if you're looking to do any kind of land contracts. Yeah. So having an attorney as part of your team as well. Mm -hmm. And, and how would, um, if someone wants to get in touch with you or find out more about your companies, uh, where would you direct them? Sure. Um, I would suggest going to landcontractrealty.com and, um, our contact info is right on the website. Okay. So. And I'll make sure that uh, we in the, the show notes, uh, we have that information. And, and then landcontractnotes.com as well? Yep. That's the other website. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Fantastic. 
Well, Justin, thanks so much for taking the time to, to talk with me today. I, this has been a great conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 